The Sony PlayStation Portable was one of my favorite systems of all time, and even now, in 2018, I still think it's worthwhile. The PlayStation Portable, or the PSP as it is better known, was launched in Japan in 2004 and in the following year in North America. The concept behind the PSP was not only ambitious because Sony wanted to bring console quality titles to a portable device, but also because they were taking on Nintendo, who at this point in time reigned supreme in the portable market with its Game Boy line. Now despite what you may think from, you know, me being a, I don't think you can see it from this camera angle, but I'm a huge Game Boy fan and a collector, but I was still very excited for the PSP because I don't have, I mean, I love the Game Boy, but I'm not loyal to the company itself. I like the idea of playing my games on the go. So, very excited for the PSP. This right here is not my first PSP. I actually broke my first PSP because it was second or third hand by the time I bought it and there was a little bit of dust under the screen. I disassembled the thing to try to get it out and I ended up breaking the LCD underneath. I literally ran to Best Buy immediately and they were almost at closing time but I ran, literally ran there to buy a new one. That's how big a fan I was of this thing. This right here is the PSP 2000 model. It was the first redesign of the PSP line. Sometime later the PSP 3000 with some more incremental improvements would hit the scene. They are almost the same thing. There's, to my, in my experience, there isn't that much difference. The screen on the PSP 2000 and 3000 were better than the first PSP and they were lighter as well because there was a lot more metal in the construction of the original PlayStation Portable. But again, for the layperson, they're eh, kind of the same thing. Two years later, Sony put out this thing, the PlayStation Portable Go, the PSP Go. As you can see, it has a nice slide out design here. Uh, it hides the controllers here behind the screen. Once it's closed, it looks like a phone really, so you can watch your videos like this a little more compact. It has 16 gigs of internal memory, so you're not relying strictly on memory sticks like was the case with the original PSP. It also has Bluetooth, so you can connect a pair of Bluetooth headphones or a PlayStation controller. It also came with a dock so you could actually have this docked on your TV having the game being beamed to the television and playing from the couch with a PS3 controller. So yeah, technically Nintendo wasn't the first to come up with that concept, a portable system that can be played on the TV. Sadly for collectors like myself, the PSP Go dock didn't sell very well so it's kind of hard to come by. Of course around the same time the PSP was born, Nintendo put out the Nintendo DS, and this is my very first Nintendo DS here, the original model. And the DS, I mean, I don't even have to say anything, it sold like crazy, it had all those Nintendo AAA first party titles. It was a massive success for Nintendo, uh, so much so, I have, I have two here, I have the Nintendo DS Lite, which is to this day one of my favorite portable consoles ever. Library, the design of the thing itself, I just, I love this thing. Now here's the problem, because the PSP was contemporary with the DS, its competitor, and the the DS sold so much, a lot of people have this notion that the PSP didn't sell very well, which is actually, I think, one of the biggest misconceptions in all of gaming. Think about it this way, the PSP sold 80 million units, that's a lot, and in fact, that's about the same amount of sales of the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo put together. Think about how many people you knew growing up that had either a Super Nintendo or a Sega Genesis. That's the number of PSPs out there, which is a great thing for collectors like myself because that means that the PSP is is very affordable in the second-hand market. So yeah, the PSP wasn't a failure for Sony by any stretch of the imagination. Of course, it didn't sell the 156 million units that the DS moved, but still, 80 millions for a portable by a company that never made them before? Not bad. Another misconception about the PSP is that it had no games, and honestly, nothing could be farther from the truth. I think the PSP had amazing titles. Every genre was well represented on this portable. You had JRPG, action RPG, tactical RPG, fighting games, racing games, rhythm games. You had it all. You had PS2 and PS3 ports. There were a lot of great games for the system. Some of my personal favorites. God of War, Chain of Olympus, uh, Grand Theft Auto, Chinatown Wars, the drug trading minigame is so addictive. Killzone Liberation was a great way to bring a shooter to a system that's, well, this small and only has one analog. It worked great. You had your hardcore AAA titles. You had your quirky, casual, obviously trying to go against what the DS was offering titles. There was something for everyone. And of course, you could mod this thing. This right here is Pokemon Fire Red from the Game Boy Advance running on a 
modded PSP Go. In fact, this is the latest addition to my collection. I've always wanted the wide PSP Go. I finally have it. But yeah, in its early infancy, hackers figured out how to mod the system to make it run unsigned code, meaning, well, piracy. Modding the PSP expands the library of the console to a ridiculous degree because you have access to, well, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. There's just so many things you can run on this thing. Some years later, the PSP became able to run PS1 titles, and that blew me away for a reason that's probably different than what it was for most people. And by the way, a lot of people give me crap for when I post pictures of emulators running on the PSP, and I have the aspect ratio stretched uh, to the whole screen, and I know that the purists think that that's an abomination, that the, the visuals are completely distorted. Here's what I have to say in my own defense. I played Super Nintendo games on the PSP far more than I ever play them on an actual Super Nintendo, and I just got used to that aspect ratio. As messed up as it may look, that's what seems familiar to me now. But yeah, in case you're wondering, you can actually run them on the proper aspect ratio. You see, the PS1 had a pretty big library of uh, real-time strategy games ported over from the computer. And I have always been a huge fan of real-time strategy titles. As you can see right here, I'm playing Warcraft 2. The PS1 port. The idea of being able to play real-time strategy games on the go, even if the control scheme isn't perfect, is something that blew me away. When I found out that there were so many of my favorite PC titles that had been ported to the PS1, and now I could play them on the bus, that was, seriously, that was amazing. I cannot overstate how amazed I was at that possibility. And what's interesting is that a lot of these PS1 real-time strategy games have been uh, adapted really well for a controller. Like, I'm not sure if you can see really well here, but basically since, so I'm playing Warcraft 2 here, right? So the way you boot up, like, so you don't have to be moving your cursor around the screen a lot, what they do is they bind the square button to bring up the construction menu. So now, what you're using to select your units becomes a selector of the actions for that uh, unit. So you can choose to build, let's say here, a town hall. So I'm gonna place it down hole right, let's say right about here. So that works way better than you would imagine. And again, like I said, there were so many amazing RTSs that were ported for the PS1. So you had Command and Conquer and Command and Conquer Red Alert. You had Zed, you had KKND, Warcraft 2. Warcraft 2 in my pocket? Are you kidding me? And the thing is, I've since gained the ability to play all those games on other systems that are far more capable, like the GPDXT, a, an Android tablet shaped like a console that is very capable, much more so than the PSP. I can actually play the DOS version of all of those games I just mentioned, but this is a little bit bigger, and like I said, the PSP was actually one of my first purchases after I moved to Canada. This is the first thing I bought, well not this one, I broke that one, but the PSP was one of the first, the first thing I bought with my own money when I immigrated to Canada, so I have sentimental attachment. Plus, this thing is tiny, the GPDXD, not so much. I mean, you could argue that this is basically just a 3DS XL, and it's not that big, but this fits in a breast pocket. So, I mean, look at this, look at this thing. So yeah, I think the PSP, especially the PSP Go, this white model here right now is my favorite PSP version. I think the PSP is still very, very worthwhile, even in 2018. Now, Speaking of price, you can grab a secondhand PSP on the internet for about $50, $60. I've even seen it as low as $30 at the local flea market. The white PSP Go you see here is a little bit pricier though. So yeah, this is the PSP. I am still in love with the system, especially the white PSP Go. I've wanted this thing for so long and I still think it's worth it even in 2018. But what do you think? Did you have one of these guys? Did you always want to have a PSP? Hey, it's never too late. They're, I think, more affordable than ever right now. Let me know in the comments what were your favorite PSP games. And that's all the time I have for today. I'll see you guys next time.